Um, hello, everybody. Um, so this is slightly different from a lot of things that we've actually heard of um, over the last couple of days. But obviously, at the end of the day, we've been talking about textiles, and they do ultimately need to be conserved. So the subject of conservation and indigo, it's vast, and to try and explain it within 20 minutes is um, slightly impossible. But I will try to give a brief overview of it on the huge subject. Uh, textile, a noun. A textile, filament, the raw material of fibre or a yarn that is made into a fabric or cloth. The word textile is also used to represent the type of cloth or the woven fabric itself. Textile, the branch of industry um, involved in the manufacture of cloth. Conservation, a noun, the act of conserving, prevention of decay, waste or loss. Conservation is the action of preserving something in particular or protecting an occurrence of improvement by virtue or preventing further loss by stabilizing the condition and slowing down further deterioration and other changes. Conservation is the relationship between the conservator, the ethical principles and the obligation for the correct conservation treatment for any object. The primary role of the conservator is the preservation of cultural heritage for the benefit of present and future generations to contribute to the insight and understanding of cultural heritage in respect of its environment and its meaning. It is a time-consuming job from start to finish and to begin to understand the process of conservation of any textile is to understand why the textile has degraded in the first place. Restoration. Restoration consists of an action carried out on a damaged object with the aim of making it easy its perception, appreciation and understanding while respecting as far as possible its aesthetic, historic and its physical property. Defining whether it is conservation or restoration is normally decided on the onset of each project and whether it is a historic object or that it may or may not be used. These are decisions that have to be taken, but who makes these decisions and what are the reasons for making them? Ultimately, the decision is determined by the condition, the historic importance and the need of the textile itself. We also need to look at the role of a preventative conservation. Um, and I've got here, I've actually, I'm sorry, not very good at this. Not moving. I have, mm -mm. Sorry, I have no idea what's going on here. <coughs> I'm going the wrong way. I don't want to. Use, I want to go back to the back. back is red. No. I want to go back. It's not going back. Oh, there we go. I go one forward. Okay. Thank you. Um, so here we've got uh, an example of restoration where all the embroidery is missing here and it's actually been restored there. Part of preventative conservation is also the, um, where we can actually do facsimiles if we cannot actually um, use the object ourselves. So preventative conservation consists of an indirect action to slow down deterioration and prevent damage by creating conditions that are ideal for preservation of textiles and cultural heritage as far as that is compatible with the social use. Preventative conservation also includes correct handling, transport, use, storage and display. And it may also involve the production of facsimiles for the purpose of preserving the original. Today we are talking mainly about conservation and preservation, uh, preventative conservation of textiles that have either been fully or partly dyed with indigo. Many of the examples in these slides are from the Kia collection and can serve for display at the Dallas Museum. So indigo. I'm not getting on with this thing at all. Indigo, mid-16th century, from Portugal, Guise. Indigo, via Latin from Greek, indicon, from indicon, Indian, dye. 
I will not go into the detail of the actual indigo dye itself, um, as this has been covered by many other papers. But the king of dyes from early history, a deep, deep rich color, close to the color wheel blue, as well as one of the seven colors of the rainbow. Its first known recorded use of indigo as a color name in English was in 1289. The ancient Greeks referred to the project of the indigo dye as the Indicon. Asian cultures, including India, Indonesia, and China, have a long tradition of using indigo to print, dye, and batik textiles. Japan de developed a heated vat method to dye fabrics and decorate them with the, using multiple techniques, including shibori. Indigo was also used in the Americas long before the arrival of Europeans. The Guatemalan people called the native indigo the blue herb and used it to paint murals, pottery, cloth, and furniture. Inca mummies were wrapped in cloth of dyed with indigo, and indigo was also used for eye shadow and hair dye in both the old and the new worlds. This is a fragment which we've actually seen in another couple of papers, but it was quite an important finding when it was actually discovered that indigo was, in fact, earlier than, than we thought. So it is the fragment from around 6,000 years ago from the Andean Indians. The methods of conserving indigo dyed textiles is similar to conserving any other textile, apart from the fact that the color may not always be stable and that the dyeing process builds up the dye stuff in layers on the fibers rather than saturates the fiber itself. When any fiber is dyed, it suffers a low decrease in strength, especially with reactive and indigo dyes. And this can then lead to greater entanglement and collusion of, of the fibers. Damage is also caused by different finishes of the dyed indigo cloth, for example, the practice of burnishing. The cloth is coated with various finishes, such as egg, egg whites, fermented juices, and blood, and then beaten with wooden mallets on top of a large stone. This produces a wonderful shiny cloth, but poses many conservation issue, issues and problems, and such damage to the fibers and how to deal with the finishes. Other causes of damage are Humidity, if it's not kept within 50 to 50 high, um, 55 percent relative humidity. Temperature outside of 18 to 1, um, 21 degrees centigrade. This is um, readings which are taken from a Bangalore um, store in October 2031. And this slide is, um, they're both in uncontrolled environments, but this one is open shelving, and this is actually the one with the door closed. And as a preventative measure, you can see that just by closing the door, you have actually, the levels of humidity and temperature are much less erratic. There are other preventative measures that can be used. Silica gel is a very effective way of controlling humidity. Art sorb controls humidity by absorbing moisture and when it's too humid and desorbed sorry, of moisture when it's dry. Sheets can be used to line drawers and pouches of bees can be used in display for the storage units. Light. Light causes irre irreversible damage. All textiles are easily damaged by any kind of light. Silk is the most vulnerable, but prolonged exposure will cause damage to any fiber and, and textiles, such as fading, yellowing, and becoming very brittle. Again, preventative measures, such as covering objects, turning off lights when possible, can help long-term damage. To reduce UV radiation from fluorescent lamps, UV filtering sleeves or tubes can be installed. Apply UV films to windows, use UV filtered glass. Pests and insects. Moths, silverfish, other insects can do enormous damage. They can even somehow manage to enter sealed and glazed frames. And all pests thrived if undisturbed. These are some of the other pests that like to find their home in their textiles, both in India and in Europe. And some of the preventative measures that you can, can include, determining the cause and the orange, origin of the infestation, screen windows, ventilation openings, eaves, etc., 
install bird netting if necessary, undertake necessary repairs and maintenance to building fabric. Regular checks should be made to ensure clean storage and surroundings. <clears throat> Mothballs should not be used. They are a health issue and a banned substance, and there are safe alternatives that can actually be used. Other causes of deterioration are just natural de uh, degradation on its own, previous treatments, environmental factors, use, pollutants, poor storage and display. Damage is inevitably a consequence of use, and with good heap housekeeping practices or preventative conservation, it can be minimized. There are many techniques used in conservation. The main ones are cleaning, stitching, adhesive treatment, and netting, but in order to get to any conclusion for the correct treatment, it is important to have your correct information. Documentation. This is an example of a conservation treatment report. It is for a single child's sandal from Egypt, 15th century. Doing a detailed examination determines relevant existing information of the identification, the composition, and the assessment of the condition of the object. The identification of the nature and the extent of the alterations. The assessment of the cause of the deterioration, deterioration and to determine the type and extent of the treatment needed. Once all this information is collected, the conservator can take on the responsibility for, responsibility for drawing up the conservation plans and the treatment proposal, include the preventative conservation, documentation, observations, and any other interventions. There is now a lot more emphasis on documentation, and at the end of each conservation project, a report should be compiled using the information collected, plus the actual treatment that has been given. All documentation will be from the original state and, certain all, and contain all interventions and relevant information for both owner and the conservator. Detail of any historic, artistic or technological importance revealed during conservation work can be delivered with the final report. Um, here you can see this is the, um, the condition before the shoe came in and then this is the actual issues where we actually dealt with all the problems which were going on. So you can see that even a very small item can actually have a lot of um, issues to deal with. This is also a time when other tests can be done, for example, to see what dyes were used. Um, okay. um, as I said before, most of the textiles in this paper contain indigo dye, and this slide, sorry, we've gone one, there we go, I'm missing one. Um, so this is a test which actually shows whether there was indigo present or not. Um, I'm actually missing one of my slides. It was there when I put it on, but it's not there now, but it doesn't matter. So on figure here, 28, we took, did a test with sulfuric acid, and that actually produced... Actually, it's the first one that I'm missing, which is irritating. Um, this one, sorry, I've got to work out now which ones they are. So this one actually shows the blue in the sulfuric acid, and that actually shows presence of indigo. This one here was actually with methylene chlorine, and it actually shows a clear top, but a, a bl dark blue at the bottom, and that again indicates the presence of indigo. The third slide, which is here, um, was actually um, tested with an iron sulfate, and the top layer uh, was transparent, the middle layer was dark blue, and the bottom was opaque, um, again revealing the presence of indigo. Once these tests are done, you can get on to um, actually dealing with the textile. Suction cleaning. Most textiles, whether they're large or small, um, are surface cleaned with using a variable controlled vacuum cleaner, museum vacuum cleaner, on both the back and the front to remove any particulate soiling. The colours may become as bright as they were originally, but they will be much clearer and there will be much more clarity of design. Wet cleaning, to wet clean or not. 
Color flask tests need to be made to ascertain the dye stability, and then it's easy to make your decision. Depending on the test results, the textile would be given a total immersion, as this is one of the most effective ways of removing any dirt. This is a wet clean bath, which we made to clean a Susani, which also contained indigo dye. Um, and it's with using softened water and a conservation grade detergent, which is dehypon, which is LS45. This project was worked on by Jessica Burgess um, on an early 19th century indigo dyed cotton jacket from Ireland. It was given a suction clean. It was also decided that due to the level of the dirt, staining and heavy creasing that it could benefit from a total immersion using deionized water with, again, a small amount of dehypon, which was just basically to break the surface tension. The jacket was also given a localized staining treatment here um, using a multi-saw um, blotting paper on the stains. And you can see here um, Jessica's doing it, and this is the blotting paper, which is actually where it's lifting all the staining off. Once the staining had been removed, then we gave it a complete wash. Stain removal. If there is adhesive, stains, or wax, tests can be conducted on any cleaning agent and solvent to decide upon completion of these tests and their results. There are many treatments available using solvent cleaning pulses, which have for good results. With any stain, it is possible that they may not go completely, and this can be dependent on many reasons length of time that the stain has been there, the type of stain, or the strength and the weakness of the textile. Stitches. Oh, sorry, this is um, a slide of the jacket once it was completed, and it certainly looks much, much better than it was. Um, going on to stitch techniques. Once the cleaning processes are complete, the next stage is stabilizing the textile. And these are some of the types of stitches that we use. Depending on the damage of the textile, either a total or a partial support will be needed. And this should be of a fabric of similar color and type. The direction of the weave on the support will be aligned to the di direction of the weave in the textile itself. The areas of damage can then be couched onto this support. And this is a couching stitch here. Um, you can see it's actually a long thread. It's actually used from the, um, it begins in the sound area of the textile. There are small stitches which actually go over um, to right angles over the top. And this is a very, very effective way of actually um, stitching down very delicate damage. Additional stitches that we use are the herringbone stitch, a simple interfacing stitch, similar to cross stitch. It's worked from left to right and secures raw edges. The herringbone stitch can be used to join two la layers of fabric while maintaining flexibility. It is also frequently used to hold down single fold hems and edges of patches. Slip stitch. This is um, almost invisible on the right side. It's used for blind hemming to attach linings to textiles. It's worked loosely and it avoids undesirable tensions between the backing fabrics and the actual textile. Whip stitch, when more than one width of fabric is needed to back a textile, a whip stitch is joined, used to join the two salvages. And you can see here in, oops, in A, you're binding it over. When, when you open it up, you've actually got a very flat seam, so it actually doesn't put a lot of damage onto the um, textile itself. Netting. Um, or partial netting is a safe and secure way to conserve very damaged textiles where using a stitching method would be harmful. These fragments are part of a hat from Egypt 14th to 15th century. The treatment included releasing the fragments from the original mount, lightly surface cleaning using the controlled fac, lightly humidified with deionized water using an ultrasonic humidifier. The fragments were sandwiched between color matched nylon, nylon net and stitching was carried out around the fragments to ensure that they would stay firmly in place. So you can see here we removed it from this mount board and it was netted and I think it looks like it was probably netted in the 70s but all the adhesive had been leaking and leaching out. 
So we removed it all, and this is where we've replaced it, but we've also put a secure mount around it so that it's actually quite protected. So the loose custom mount was... Uh, not much more, no. Um, I will go on to adhesive supports. Textiles can either be given the total or a partial adhesive bond, depending, on, again, on the damage. Adhesive is never applied directly to any textile, um, as this can cause problems. The choice of material, again, of adhesives is dependent on test, test, testings. This is the conservation of an Italian skilled compound tool fragment, again, from the 13th century. Contains both um, indigo and madder and various other um, natural dyes. Um, we removed it from this, um, the card. It was quite difficult, and you can see that we've um, managed to get it actually off the cardboard, and here it is with the loose threads. We decided to use an adhesive treatment on this because it was just too damaged and any stitching going into it was going to damage it. And here it is at the end, and you can actually see, again, you can actually begin to see the actual design of the griffins back on it. Um, I've gone through that bit, bit quickly. Storage is very, very important, um, as the, and it's very important because relative humidity and temperature change in each building, so you really have to look at that quite carefully. Mold and mildew um, thrive in warm, damp atmospheres. Um, many textiles need to be stored flat. Um, if you are storing them flat, interleave them with acid-free Text um, tissue. Any damage, um, sorry, to prevent stacking of textiles, please, as this again creates not only heavy creasing lines but also general damage to the fibres, which is where we came in, which was damage to the fibres. So I feel it's a good place to end on this paper. But um, we must not forget that actually any conservator's work is guided by ethical standards um, across the world from both ICOM and ICON. Thank you, thank you for listening, and thank you to various people as well. Thank you.